Okay, let's look at uh, an additional example of working problems involving the acceleration due to gravity. Okay, here's an example. Like a lot of physics problems, it's got multiple parts, so you can consider this one example or maybe several examples, but uh, either way, it says a baseball is thrown straight up from some initial height y naught equal to zero with uh, an initial velocity of 35 meters per second. And so we already know the initial position is y naught equal to zero. The initial velocity is 35 meters per second. We can assume air resistance is negligible and that gravity is the only force acting on the ball. That means the acceleration due to gravity is going to be little g. So we can note that if I draw a coordinate system in the usual way, this would be my x-axis and this would be my y-axis, and my little g is going to be pointing down, so little g would point in the negative y direction, or if you wanted to be really anal, the negative y-hat direction. We know that the ball is being shot upwards, and it has an initial velocity v naught, and that that is equal to 35 meters per second. And I've drawn my ball on top of my coordinate system to let me know that, that my initial position is at the origin of my coordinate system. So given that, we have the problem is asking what is the velocity of the ball at the top of its path. So the ball is going to go up, it's going to stop for a moment, and then it's going to come back down. How fast is it going at the top? We want to know what the acceleration of the ball is at the top of the path. How long does it take to reach the maximum height? What maximum height does it reach relative to its starting point? How long does it take to return to its initial height? And what is the velocity it has when it returns to its initial height? So there's a lot to unpack here. So let's uh, look at this example because this example has a lot of very important ideas that are going to be widely apl applicable to many different types of motion. So let's look at uh, part A and part B here. We want to find the velocity of the ball at the top. And I think you'll agree that the velocity of the ball at the top has to be zero because the ball is going up, it stops for a moment, and then it comes back down. The peak of the path represents a turning point in the ball's motion. Uh, so we know it has to stop before it can turn around. And so at that moment when it stops, its velocity is going to be zero. Now, part B asked what the acceleration at the top would be. The acceleration at the top. Now, here's the thing. Now, a lot of people would conflate the meaning of velocity and acceleration together. And so if I asked what's the acceleration at the top, a lot of people want to tell me that the acceleration at the top is zero because they're not thinking about acceleration. They're thinking about velocity. You have to keep these things straight. What's the acceleration at the top? So let's think just in general for a moment. This ball is going up, and it's slowing down on the way up. The acceleration is pointing down, and it is 9.81 meters per second squared. On the way down, it's speeding up. Again, the acceleration is pointing down. The velocity is going down, so it's going to be speeding up. And again, that acceleration is 9.81 meters per second squared. What is the acceleration at the top? It's the same. It's the same as if I dropped it from rest. The instant it leaves my hand, it's going to start falling with the, the acceleration 9.81 meters per second squared. If it th goes up and it stops, even though it's not moving at the top, it's still accelerating because that next second it's going to be going 9.81 meters per second downward. That is how fast it'll be going. And the next second after that, it'll get an additional... 9.81 meters per second velocity change. Every tick of the clock, but even when it stopped, it's still accelerating. And the acceleration due to gravity is the same at every point in that path. So when I ask you on a test, what is the acceleration due to gravity at the top of the path? Don't tell me it's zero because that's what the velocity is at the top. You have to keep straight which one is velocity and which one is acceleration. Stop and think. And remember that the acceleration due to gravity for any freely falling object is going to be 9.81 meters per second squared downward. Now part C asks, how long does it take the ball to reach, its, reach the top of its trajectory? 
Over here on the right, I have written down, just for reference, those three uh, most useful kinematics equations. And we're asked, how long does it take the ball to reach the top of its trajectory? And so the way we work these problems is we just pick one of these three equations and we start plugging stuff in. And we'll either find that we have everything that we need to plug it in and solve for the unknown, or we'll find that there's too many unknowns, that we don't have everything we need. And so if you find that you don't have everything you need, you go to the next equation and then try that one. And if that doesn't work, you go to the next one and try that one. And so that is sort of the approach that I want you guys to take for these problems. Think about what you're given in the problem. Think about what it is you're trying to solve for. And then find which one of these equations relates the things you know to the thing you're looking for. So right now, we're trying to find how long. That's a time. So clearly this third equation is not going to be very much use to us because it doesn't have any time in it. So we're going to maybe not try that one. What about the first one? Do I know the velocity of the ball at the top of its trajectory? We just said that it was zero. So yes, we know that that's zero. We're given the initial velocity is 35 meters per second upward. We're given the acceleration is little g downward. And so we do know what all of these values are except for the time. So all we have to do is plug them into that kinematics equation and solve for the time. And so here I put in the final velocity, the initial velocity minus gt, because the acceleration is minus g, so it goes from plus a to minus g. Then down below, I just plugged in the number for little g, 9.81 meters per second squared. And I solve for the time, which is some basic algebra. You solve for the time, it's 35 meters per second divided by 9.81 meters per second squared. Notice the units here, they work out because I've got meters per second in the top and meters per second in the bottom that are all going to cancel. So those are going to cancel with that meter in one of those seconds. And that leaves 1 over 1 over seconds as my units. But when you do 1 over 1 over seconds, that's just equal to seconds. And so the units work out to be seconds. I divide 35 by 9.81, and I get 3.56 seconds. And that is what? That is the time it takes to reach the top of the trajectory. So that is the time it takes to get to the top of the path. Technically, if we're being anal, it's the time it takes for the ball to slow down and reach a speed of zero. Because it starts at 35, but then it's slowing down with each tick of the clock because of the acceleration, and that's how long it takes to reach a zero velocity. But when it reaches zero velocity, that's when it's at the top of the path. So that's also the time it takes to get to the top of the path which is what we were looking for in the first place. Now the next part of the problem was to find the maximum height that it will reach. And so we can look here. We know that height is a position kind of a thing. And so uh, we've got our V here, V naught plus AT. Uh, here's our height Y. And this is Y is equal to Y naught plus V naught T plus one half AT squared. Do What we're looking for is the y. We know the initial height is going to be 0 because I can set my initial height to be anything I want by where I put my coordinate system. I know that v naught is given as 35 meters per second. I know that a is little g minus little g, in fact. And so I can plug all of these values in, and I know the time. We got the time was 3.6 seconds in the previous problem. So if I plug all of those values into that equation, I get the height is 64 meters. Incidentally, I just noticed that there is actually a mistake in my little legend up here. I wrote this equation in terms of x, even though we're dealing with terms of y. And I maybe should have pointed that out explicitly, because when we derived the kinematics equations in the previous video, we did it in terms of motion along the x-axis, but it doesn't matter. We can just the same move along the y-axis. If the acceleration is constant, they apply in either or both directions. But if I wanted to be consistent, I might want to call that y. Just as an FYI, I didn't want anyone to see that and be confused. 
So anyway, sorry about that. I'm not going to go back and fix it because uh, I think that's a fairly trivial error. But anywho, this is how you get the height. Now, another thing that I want to mention to you is that in the previous problem, we were asked to find the time. In this problem, we were asked to find the height. But what if this was the first problem? What if we didn't know the time? Well, we could do one of two things. We could do exactly what we did before. We could find the time using the equation above, or we could apply this third equation, which doesn't have the time in it. Either of those approaches would work. But let's talk about what we did, because in the first part of the problem, we found the time, and then we plugged it in to the second part to find the height. So this is something that we can do in general. Very often, so we've got these three equations, and very often we know what we want. We want to find the velocity or the position or something. Part of well, There's some variable in one of these equations that we want to find. And so let's say we want to find the height, and we know that we need y, but we don't have the time, or we don't have the initial velocity, or something, that we're lacking something. So if you know which equation you need, but you only need one more thing to find it, well, guess what? You can probably find the thing you need in one of the other equations. So if you need the time, you might be able to find it in this equation. Or if you need v naught, you might be able to find it in that equation as well. Or maybe you can find it in that equation, based on what's given in the problem. So essentially, the worst case scenario is that you don't have everything that you need to solve for what you're looking for, but you can find everything you need in the other equations. And generally, it's only going to be a two-step process. Find one thing you need in one equation and plug it into the, the other equation. So I just wanted to mention that because that's sort of the process for solving these problems. You figure out what it is that you're looking for, you figure out all the things that you know about the problem, and then you find which of these three equations connect what you are looking for to what you know. And it's just like a puzzle. You just have to plug and chug until you figure out how to find all the things you need to find the, the thing that you're looking for. About y variables. Ah! So let's keep going, and we're going to look at part E, which asks, what is the amount of time it takes to return to the initial height y equals y naught, which is equal to zero? And so we have our kinematics equation, and let me write out the whole thing. So I have the y position is y naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. We know that y naught is equal to zero, so I can get rid of that. And we know that a is equal to minus g, so I can just plug those in. And so I've got my y is equal to v naught t minus one half g t squared, and that is what I ended up here with. And so now it's just plug in the values I know and solve for the time. So I know it's given in the problem, the initial velocity is 35 meters per second straight up, so that's going to be positive. The acceleration is, four, is going to be one half 9.8, which is 4.9, and it's minus because the acceleration is pointing downwards. That's times t squared. And so if I rearrange this equation, I can uh, say that I've got a constant times t squared plus another constant times t is equal to zero. And that is an example of what we call a quadratic equation. And so we know how to solve quadratic equations. We can either apply the quadratic formula or we can factor. And since there's no constant term here, it's just both terms have a t, one's t squared, the other is just plain t, um, we can factor. And so I can factor out one of t, one of these two t's, I can factor out that t, and so when I do that, I have t times the stuff in the brackets, 35 meters per second minus 4.9 meters per second squared t. And so when I do that, if I were to multiply this t through to each of these two terms, I'd end up back with what I started up above. So that's a proper factoring. And so that gives me t times the stuff in the brackets is equal to zero. Now, if you've got two things multiplied together equal to zero, 
if either of those things is equal to zero, then that equation is true. So if t is equal to zero, then this whole equation is true. If the stuff in the brackets is equal to zero, then this whole equation is true. So either t equals to zero, or if I solve the stuff, if I set the stuff in brackets equal to zero, so this is the stuff in brackets equal to zero, if I solve that for t, I get 7.1 seconds. And that is the total time it takes to return to the initial position. It's the time it takes to go up, to pause momentarily, and then come back down. That's 7.1 seconds. Now, notice here, what kind of equation did we have? Starts with a Q, ends with a quadratic. This is a quadratic equation. It's got two answers, two roots. And so what we've done when we factor it in this way is we've actually solved for both times when y is equal to 0. And so that's what we did. We set y equal to 0, and then we solve for the times when that's true. And so we know that y is equal to 0 when we launch the ball upwards, and we also find that the time is going to be 7.1 seconds when the ball returns to where it started. And so it's kind of nice that the math shows you both times when the position was 0. Now, I'd like to look at this equation a little bit. We've got y is equal to y naught plus v naught t plus 1 half a t squared. That's going to be a parabola. That's the shape of the curve. If I plot this out, I'm going to get a parabolic shape. Now, the interesting thing that we know about parabolas is that they're symmetric. If I draw a straight line through the center of the parabola, and we'll pretend that that's a straight line, one side is a mirror image of the other. And so it's interesting because if we look at the time, the time it takes to get to the top, we solved in part C, I think, that was 3.56 seconds. And the round trip time, up and then down, that's 7.1 seconds. But look, that's 3.56, that's basically another 3.56. There's a symmetry here. The time it takes to go up equals the time it takes to fall back down you know, with insignificant figures. So, what does that tell you? That tells you that if I find the time it takes to get to the top, and I want to find the time it takes to return, all I have to do is double the time it takes to get to the top. Now, if I do that on a test, I want you to use the magic physics words. Because if you just do that and you don't explain why you can do that, I'm going to count off. Because I want to know that you understand, you're not just doing things that you've memorized to do, I want you to know that you understand them. And so the magic words that let you do this on a test are by symmetry. So if you recognize that you can exploit symmetry to find the answer of something, you can save yourself a little bit of time and work. Symmetry arguments are very powerful things in physics, and we will use them all the time when they're applicable. But you can only use them when they apply, when there's an actual symmetry to exploit. So, for example, what would be an example when it doesn't work? If I threw my ball up, and on the way back down it landed on the roof of a building, then this is not a symmetric situation. I couldn't use a symmetry argument to find out how long it took to get here. How would I find out how long it took to get there? Well, if this is some y value, I just plug that into my equation. I'd plug it in over there, and I'd solve for the amount of time it took to get there. It's that easy. So that is the basic idea. And by the way, if I did this example where it landed on a rooftop and I tried to solve for the time, my quadratic equation would give me that time, and it would give me the time over here when the ball was going up and was at that same height. That's just how it works. So in general, if you're given a height that you want the ball to reach, you just use your kinematics equation. But if you have the entire trip and it comes back to where it started, there's a symmetry there that you can exploit. Now, the last part of the example asked, what was the velocity that it had when it returned to its initial position? And so we know if we're looking for velocity, we might look at this equation. We've got V is equal to V naught minus GT. Negative G is the acceleration. So we can plug in our numbers, 35 meters per second, minus little g here, times the time it takes to go for the whole trip. 
And when we do that, we end up with a V equals minus 35 meters per second. The initial velocity was 35 meters per second. The final velocity was minus 35. And again, that's one of those things that we can use symmetry to exploit. If I've got my ball going up and it comes down, whatever the velocity it has starting out, when it returns, it'll have that same velocity but in the opposite direction. It'll have, I should say, let's be careful with the words we choose. It will have the same speed. The amount of the velocity will be the same, but the direction will be opposite. So that's uh, some different examples of problems that you can work involving the acceleration due to gravity, and you'll get some more chance to practice them on your homework.